these last uh, five chapters of the book have been what we have called portraits and prophecy. If you don't have a an outline, those first three we have looked at already, which was uh, Zechariah chapter ten, which was Christ the cornerstone. Uh, we looked at portrait two, which was Christ the shepherd in chapter eleven, and portrait three, Jerusalem in chapter 12. Tonight we will finish with portrait number four, which is false prophets in chapter 13. And then the last portrait, chapter 14, which will be portraits that are not yet fulfilled in prophecy. Now, chapter 13 really picks up on the premise from chapter 12. If you'll turn back a page, chapter 12 and look at verse 10 and 11 the prophet writes and i will pour out on the house of david and on the inhabitants of jerusalem the spirit of grace and supplication then they will look on me whom they pierced yes they will mourn for him as one mourns for his only son and grieve for him as one grieves for his firstborn in that day there will be great mourning in jerusalem like the morning at Hadad Ramon and in the plain of Megiddo. Now, as we concluded chapter 12 last week, we see here that Israel recognized or finally recognizes their Messiah. And from this recognition, this realization that Jesus is their Messiah, their eyes have been opened to this reality, which brings us to chapter 13, verse 1. In that day, a fountain shall be opened for the house of David and for the inhabitants of Jerusalem for sin and for uncleanness. So their recognition of Jesus brings this fountain of cleansing, cleansing from sin and being unclean. Now, when again, we look back at chapter 12 and verse 11, it says that in that day, there will be great mourning in Jerusalem, like the morning of Hadad Ramon and in the plain of Megiddo. See, great mourning is the implication that they were broken about their sin. <coughs> Last week, we closed with looking at Psalm 51, that psalm that David wrote after he was caught in sin. Now, remember, David didn't come and confess. He was living in denial. But when confronted by the prophet Nathan, he recognized his sin confessed his sin, and he mourned over his sin. Here, Zechariah gives us a beautiful word picture of God's love and grace to a repentant, mournful heart. It's a picture of a fountain that cleanses us from sin. Now, it reminds uh, us of some of those older hymns, right? What can wash away my sin? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. What can make me whole again? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Oh, precious is the flow that makes me white as snow. No other fount I know. Nothing but the blood of Jesus. See, that fountain that Zachariah is describing for us is not something temporary. It is something that will flow forever. The other old hymn, there's a fountain filled with blood drawn from Emmanuel's veins and sinners plunge beneath that flood, lose all their guilty stains. That's exactly what Zechariah is describing to us here. See, this analogy of a fountain is very applicable to the people of that day. See, in that time, these people were an agrarian society, which means they were dependent in working the land and they were dependent on rain. See, a well could be dug, but their main source in the area of Jerusalem and Israel was rain. But a fountain that springs up that is always flowing would mean sustenance and livelihood for them continually. Now think about what this would mean to a people that are for the most part farmers, and livestock owners. See, they were extremely dependent on a water source. See, this picture of a fountain would bring relief to them for this picture of consistent, 
supply of water. But here, the analogy of consistent is more of consistent right relationship with God. See, in that day, water will flow from Jerusalem constantly for the cleansing of sin. Let's pick up in verse 2. And it shall be in that day, says the Lord of hosts, that I will cut off the names of the idols of the land, and they will no longer be remembered. I will also cut off the prophets and the unclean spirit to depart from the land. Now, remember, Israel has had two major problems. They're both sin, and those problems they had were idolatry and false prophets. Idolatry is defined as an object of reverence and the means of deviation. So something that is going to take you away from focusing on the Lord. There was also an issue with false prophets, one who, acting the part of a divinely inspired prophet, utters falsehoods under the name of divine prophecies. That's what Strong's defines as a false prophet. In God's eyes, these are sin. God now provides a fountain for cleansing and a promise to remove not only the sin, but the source of sin. Let's pick up in verse 3. And it shall come to pass that anyone who still prophesies, then his father or mother who begot him will say to him, you shall not live because you have spoken lies in the name of the Lord. And his father and mother who begot him will thrust him through when he prophesies. This is interesting because today public opinion is really accepting of anything and everything. But this day will come when public opinion will be righteous. The people will be so committed to the Lord that even if a family member is found to be a false prophet, the family will condemn that false prophet. Verse 4, And it shall be in the day that every prophet will be ashamed of his visions when he prophesies. They will not wear a robe of coarse hair to deceive, but he will say, I am no prophet, I am a farmer. For a man taught me to keep cattle from my youth. And one will say to him, well, what are these wounds between your arms? And he will answer, well, those are which I was wounded in the house of my friends. What exactly does this mean? Well, this prophets of the day, they wore camel hair, a robe of coarse hair with the coarse part being on the inside. And they would also harm themselves bearing self-inflicted wounds. Remember when we went through the book of First Kings, uh, we were told that those prophets of Baal, their prayers weren't being answered, so what did they do? They started cutting themselves, right? See, they, this was all showing how spiritual they are, self-inflicted suffering for God. Now, today it's not so quite so easy to spot a false prophet, uh, by dress or scarred body, but I can assure you it is quite easy. Now, remember our study in 1 Corinthians. The Holy Spirit, specifically in the, in, with spiritual gifts, will always bring attention to Jesus, never to a man or to the Holy Spirit himself. When you start hearing, I this, God showed me this, God gave me a vision that no one else has seen, I warned you, I, 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 you need to be very careful. You are being deceived by a false prophet. See, what you need to be on the lookout for is a prophetic word that is supported by God's word. Now, in 1 Corinthians 14, we looked at this, uh, oh my gosh, it was almost a year ago. Verse 14, verse 32 and 33. And the spirit of the prophets are subject to the prophets. For God is not the author of confusion, but of peace, as in all the churches of the saints. See, the word of God is the final authority, not a self-proclaimed prophet or what someone thinks. The word of God must support the prophetic word. Zechariah here is telling us that these once prophets, false prophets, are now putting away their sinful 
practices, and in a sense, professing to have an honest job. Verse 4. Look at this again. And it will be in that day that every prophet will be ashamed of his visions when he prophesies. They will not wear a robe of coarse hair to deceive, but he will say, I am no prophet. I am a farmer for a man taught me to keep cattle from my youth. And one will say to him, what are these wounds between your arms? And he will answer, well, those are the which I was wounded in the house of my friends. You have people here that are specifically doing something. Their goal is to deceive, probably from what we've studied for financial gain in some way. They aren't dressing like a prophet any longer. They are working for a living, and those self-inflicted wounds that they have, those scars, well, oh, well, that was an accident. I was over at Elliot's house and we got in a fight and he punched me in the mouth. That's what that scar is for, right? (laughs) They're making excuses. But see, something's changed. The Lord has intervened and says, listen, I am not having this anymore. Look at verse 7. Zechariah now changes gears a little bit and we get more of Masonic prophecy here. Verse 7. Awake, O sword, against my shepherd, against the man who is my companion. Says the Lord of hosts, strike the shepherd and the sheep will scatter. Then I turn my hand against the little ones. Now God here calls out Jesus, his son, as my shepherd, my companion. And the sword will come against Jesus. Now this would have been very difficult for the people of Zechariah's day to understand Remember what the prophet Isaiah wrote, Isaiah 53, verse 10. Yet it pleased the Lord to bruise him. He has put him to grief. When you make his soul an offering for sin, he shall see his seed, he shall prolong his days, and the pleasure of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. See, it pleased God for Jesus to be bruised, to be put to grief, to be an offering for sin. Why? Well, because he loves you and I. He loves us so much that there was no other way to get us right with him other than his son sacrificing himself. Second Corinthians chapter 5, verses 18 and 19, Paul put it this way. Now, all things are of God who has reconciled us to himself through Christ Jesus, and has given us the ministry of reconciliation. That is, that God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself. Do you understand what that says? God was in Christ reconciling you and I back to him, not imputing their trespasses to them, and has committed to us the word of reconciliation. You know, oftentimes we look at that and think, oh, well, you know, I'm supposed to... I'm reconciled to God, so I need to work hard and reconcile with other people. Of course, that's it. But the bigger picture here is understanding that God loved you and I so much, he sent his son so we could have relationship with him. That should change our lives. Jesus, the good shepherd, was struck for us. Matthew chapter 26, verse 31. Look what Jesus says here. Then Jesus said to him, them, all of you will be made to stumble because of me this night. For it is written, I will strike the shepherd and the sheep of the flock will be scattered. Hmm, that sounds familiar, doesn't it? Jesus, the perfect sacrifice. Quoting Zechariah. Now again, Zechariah changes gears again to the future. Look at verse 8. And it shall come to pass that in the land, says the Lord, that two-thirds of it shall be cut off and die, but a third shall be left in it. I will bring the third through the fire, will refine them as silver is refined, and test them as gold is tested. They will call on my name, and I will answer them. I will say, this is my people, and each one will say, the Lord is is my God. Israel was scattered. Two-thirds of the nation will be destroyed. A third will be left in the land. And then a time of purification and testing will come. Now, could it be that this prophecy lines up with our study in Revelation? 
you got a decision to make. When the Antichrist sets up his image in the temple, Israel rejects the Antichrist, and they are scattered, and they are killed. And that last three and a half years of the tribulation period, only a third of them will survive. Now, we also studied in Revelation that two-thirds of the entire world's population will be destroyed as well in all that judgment. And it is amazing how some of these puzzle pieces fit together. Let's continue. Chapter 14. Behold, the day of the Lord is coming, and your spoil will be divided in your midst, for I will gather all the nations to battle against Jerusalem. The city shall be taken, the houses rifled, the women ravished. Half of the city shall go into captivity, but the remnant of the people shall not be cut off from the city. Now, some believe that this prophecy was fulfilled in 70 AD when Israel, or Rome leveled Jerusalem. Now, although it was officially Rome that destroyed Jerusalem, we do understand that the Roman army was made up of quite a few nations because whoever they conquered, they got people to fight for them. And uh, in a sense, we could say that there was a plethora of nations that destroyed them in 70 AD. Now, the challenge of this prophecy being fulfilled in 70 AD is the next two verses because we don't see that this has happened yet. Look at verse three. Then the Lord will go forth and fight against those nations as he fights in the day of battle. And in that day, his feet will stand on the Mount of Olives, which faces Jerusalem on the east, and the Mount of Olives shall be split in two from east to west, making a very large valley. Half of the mountain shall move toward the north and half shall move toward the south. This didn't happen in 70 AD. And there are many ways to spiritualize or to make certain scenarios fit. And some of those are very interesting. Some of them seem to work. But one thing we need to be clear on in our study of the Bible is that the spiritualizing of the text is always secondary. We must look at the text for what it says and not what we think it says. We need to be good stewards of studying the Bible. Now, this text speaks of Jesus the Messiah coming to earth in the flesh, returning to the Mount of Olives, where he ascended from after his resurrection. Now, when Jesus ascended to heaven, Acts chapter 1, he was on the Mount of Olives. Luke chapter 24, verse 51 tells us that. But I want to read to you what Luke wrote in the book of Acts, chapter 1, verses 10 and 11. And when they looked steadfastly toward heaven and went up, behold, two men stood by them in white apparel, who also said, Men of Galilee, why do you stand gazing up into heaven? The same Jesus who was taken up from you into heaven will also come in like manner as you saw him go to heaven. See, when Jesus comes back, everyone's going to know it. The Mount of Olives, <laughs> it says here, Zechariah is prophesying that this thing is going to split in two. He will come back to save Israel from this battle, and I believe that that is uh, referred to in Revelation chapter 19. We'll get there in a few weeks on Sundays. So we have a couple of prophecies here that all the nations will come against Israel. The nations will take the city and do a lot of horrible things. Half the people will stay. Half of them will leave. Then God comes to defend them. Jesus will descend on the Mount of Olives and the mountain will be split in two, providing a way of escape out for this pe these people. None of this has happened yet. Verse five. Then you shall flee through the mountain valley. That The mountain split, right? The mountain valley for the mountain valley shall reach to Azel. Yes, you shall flee as you fled from the earthquake in the days of Uzziah, the king of Judah. Thus the Lord my God will come and all the saints with you. Now there's something interesting here. There is nothing historical that we can find um, outside of the Bible about this earthquake in Jerusalem. Other than Zechariah 14, this earthquake is referred to in Amos chapter 1. Remember when we went through that book. In 70 AD, there were many Jews that believed that this prophecy was going to come true at this time. 
and that God would come and save Israel from Rome, but it did not happen. They missed that the Messiah must first be rejected and the nation brought to repentance, as Zechariah mentions in chapters 11 and 12. That hasn't happened either. He says, thus the Lord my God will come with and all the saints with you. Revelation chapter 19, verses 13 and 14. He was clothed with a robe dipped in blood, and his name was called the Word of God. And the armies in heaven, clothed in fine linen, white and clean, followed him on white horses. This is when Jesus returns. Back to chapter 14, verse 6. And it shall come to pass that in that day there will be no light. The lights will diminish, and it will be... Uh, and it shall be one day which is known to the Lord, neither day nor night. But at evening time it shall happen that it will be light. So we see something interesting here. Light will fail, and this day is only known by the Lord. I mean, when it's supposed to be dark, though, it's going to be light. I don't know that, how that's going to happen, but it'll be awesome to view. Verse 8, And in that day it shall be that living waters shall flow from Jerusalem, half of them toward the eastern sea and half of them toward the western sea. In both summer and winter, it shall occur. Now that fountain flowing here is described as living water. Do you remember in John chapter four, that woman at the well? She asked Jesus, he said, hey, will you give me a drink? And then Jesus said, if you knew who I was, you'd be asking me for a drink. He said, because I would give you a drink of living water and you'll never thirst again. See, I think there's an amazing application and promise for us as believers today. Jesus said this in John chapter 7, verse 38. He who believes in me, as the scripture has said, out of his heart will flow what? rivers of living water. Amen? Amen? See, this abundance of living water flows to the east and to the west. Now, if you remember back a few weeks ago our, uh, in Ezekiel, our reading in chapter 7, Ezekiel describes a river flowing in abundance from the new temple. He tells us that it will flow to the Dead Sea and bring life again to that body of water. Anybody ever been to the Dead Sea? No. Okay. Awesome. Oh, I want to see pictures. I haven't been there yet, so I had to do a little research. The Dead Sea has 9.6 times more salt content than the ocean. No sea life, no plant life can survive in it. But Ezekiel prophesies that when this living water flows, that sea will live again. See, all of everything is going to change when Jesus returns. Many things are going to change when Jesus returns. Verse 9, and the Lord shall be king over all the earth. In that day, it shall be the Lord is one and his name is one. Verse 10, and all the land shall be turned into a plain from Gibba to Rimmon. South of Jerusalem, Jerusalem shall be raised up and inhabit, inhabited in her place from Benjamin's gate to the first, to place of the first gate and the corner gate and from the tower of Hanel and to the king's wine presses. The people shall dwell in it and no longer shall there be utter destruction, but Jerusalem shall be safely inhabited. Now, this amazing landscape of Jerusalem it's going to be interesting because it's going to be different than what it is today. Uh, the city is mostly surrounded by mountains, which is a natural defense. But when Jesus returns, he will be Israel's defense. The mountains will be flattened like a plain. Why? Well, there's going to be no need for a natural defense. And I believe the other reason is this, because in the millennial reign, you and I, there's going to be no barriers for us to go and worship. 
Let's continue on and it'll explain itself. Verse 12. And this shall be the plague with which the Lord will strike the people who fought against Jerusalem. Their flesh shall dissolve while they stand on their feet. Their eyes shall dissolve in their sockets and their tongue shall dissolve in their mouths. God will, ne- will deliver his people and their enemies will have a fate of destruction in a very <laughs> horrific way. Eyes dissolving or flesh falling off your body as you're standing there. Eyes dissolving in their sockets and tongues dissolving in your mouth. It sounds kind of gross. This brought me to a thought. I, I don't know about you. I, I'm not really afraid of dying. I think most believers aren't. I think what we're really afraid of is how we die, right? Uh, after living in Florida for many years, we had visitors, and everyone wanted to go to the beach. But some of those visitors did not want to get in the water. In fact, they, would, they were very apprehensive of even getting in up to their knees. Why? Because they were afraid of getting bitten by a shark. People do not want to be attacked by a shark. Now again, I think most believers are really not afraid of death, but just how you die is what some people are afraid of. Death by shark attack is really not something I think anyone would want to go through. Why am I telling you this? Well, one of my favorite things to do is to swim in the ocean, but not here. Now, I know my friend Laura here goes swimming, I think, every morning, most of the time. I'm not doing it. And here's why. It has nothing to do with sharks. Today, the water temperature in the ocean here in Plymouth was 10 degrees. In Fort Lauderdale, where I go swimming, the, our water temperature today was 26. Yeah. Now, why am I saying this? Listen, death described here is for the enemies of Israel, and it's pretty intense. And it's, the Bible also tells us that they are going to die by attacking each other. Look at verse 13. And it shall come to pass that in that day that a great panic from the Lord will be among them. Everyone will seize the hand of his neighbor and raise his hand against the neighbor's hand. See, the enemies are, of, that are coming against Israel are going to get a great panic from the Lord. They're going to be so frightened of whatever's going on, they're going to turn on each other. Now, this shouldn't really surprise us. There's a couple of times in the Old Testament that God has done this. God confused the Egyptians in Exodus chapter 14. When Saul was fighting the Philistines, did the same thing in 1 Samuel chapter 14. Gideon, when he was fighting the Mennonites, God did the same thing in Judges chapter 7. Now, I'm going to put up for you back in chapter 12 and verse 4, Zechariah said this, In that day, says the Lord, I will strike every horse with confusion and its rider with madness. I will open my eyes on the house of Judah and will strike every horse on the peoples with blindness. Um, I don't know that I would want to fight in that army. Back to 14, verse 14, Judah also will fight at Jerusalem and the wealth of all the surrounding nations shall be gathered together, gold, silver, and apparel in great abundance. So Jerusalem, by God's deliverance, will also become a prosperous city again. Verse 15, such also shall be the plague on the horses and the mule, on the camel and the donkey, and on all the cattle that will be in those camps, so shall this plague be. So this plague will not only devastate human life, but livestock as well. Verse 16, and it shall come to pass that everyone who is left of all the nations which came against Jerusalem shall go up from year to year to worship the king, the Lord of hosts, and to keep the feast of tabernacles. So this final battle, this victory, will bring in the millennial reign of Christ. In this 1,000-year reign, we will see worship continue in the temple of God. Nations from all over the world will come once a year to celebrate what is told us right here, 
the Feast of Tabernacles. Sukkot is what that is in Hebrew. So what is that? What is the Feast of Tabernacles? Well, that's when every year all the Jewish families would come to Jerusalem and go camping. They made tents and they lived in them for eight days, remembering God's provision in the wilderness. Now, I'm going to have to submit to this one because my idea of camping is staying at the Marriott. I do not like to camp. I did in my younger days. I remember my buddy and I going out fishing for a weekend and we hung up these hammocks and we thought we were, I woke up eaten alive by mosquitoes and I just, I'm never doing this again. This, this is not fun, but hopefully in this time it will be. And it looks like in the millennium, we'll be celebrating this holiday every year in Jerusalem, verse 17. And it shall be that whichever of the families of the earth do not come to Jerusalem to worship the king, the Lord of hosts, on them there will be no rain. If the family of Egypt will not come up and enter in, they shall have no rain. They shall receive the plague which the Lord strikes the nations who do not come up to keep the Feast of Tabernacles. This punishment of Egypt and the punishment of all the nations that do not come to keep the Feast of Ta Tabernacles. Well, that sounds kind of harsh, but let's understand something for a moment. Free will still reigns in the heart of man in the millennium. God will call you to come and celebrate. You don't have to, but if you don't, there will be consequences. One of those consequences is no rain. And this shouldn't surprise us. See, this is the same way the Spirit of God works in you and I today. God calls us to obedience to him, and in that obedience, we receive blessing. But you can choose not to be obedient, which means you choose not to be blessed, right? You realize we give God a really bad rap sometimes because something happens in our lives. My God, why'd you let this happen? I can't believe this is this. And God's like, I didn't tell you to do that. <laughs> I told you to go that way, and you wanted to go that way, so I let you go. But God, come back this way, right? It's really simple. That same precedence will take place there. Verse 20, and in that day, holiness to the Lord shall be engraved on the bells of the horses. The pots in the Lord's house shall be like the bowls before the altar. Yes, every pot in Jerusalem and Judah shall be holiness to the Lord of hosts. Everyone who sacrifices shall come and take them and cook in them. And in that day, there shall no longer be a Canaanite in the house of the Lord of hosts. Now, Exodus chapter 28, verse 36 tells us that this holiness to the Lord was an inscription on the headband of the high priest. You shall also make a plate of pure gold and engrave on it, like the engraving of the signet, holiness to the Lord. Right? That's what the high priest wore. See, the high priest had a job once a year. He would go into the Holy Holies, offer the blood sacrifice, and he would come out. And that room was not to be entered into any other time. Everything in there was holy. What does the word holy mean? Set apart, right? It, it's for one use and one use only. It was a sacred place. Everything used in the temple was to be used for God and God only. See, when Jesus reigns, everything will be sacred. Everything will be unto the Lord, or holiness to the Lord. Everything will be holy and set apart for God. Now understand something. You and I do not have to wait for the millennial reign for this to happen. And here's why I tell you this. Because we are to be holy and set apart for the Lord. And you and I can choose to be holy now. Why do I tell you this? Turn in your Bible to 1 Peter chapter 2. Look down to verse 9. 
but you are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, his own special people, that you may proclaim the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light who were once not a people, but are now the people of God, who had not obtained mercy, but now have obtained mercy. See, for us believers right now, that should just be a way of life. And sometimes we see things in our lives that God says, listen, that's not holy. I would like for that to be holy. Will you set that apart for me? Or will you, maybe you need to remove something so that you can be a little bit more holy, set apart. See, holy, sometimes we just think that it means, um, you know, I just get this special unction of doing good things. Well, that, that may be the case, but what, we're, we, what we need to understand is that it's our day-to-day -day walk, Right? It's when I get up in the morning and what's the first thing out of my mouth? You know, when I, where I go places, do I let somebody's anger affect me? When something bad happens, do I just jump on the bandwagon of being miserable with everybody else? Or do I trust in the Lord above that, as, as, as Proverbs says, a, a man plans his ways, but the Lord directs his steps, right? See, sometimes something happens that's not in our plan. Anybody ever, just me, right? <laughs> it happens all the time, every day, many times a day. But because I am a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a person that's set apart, well then I'm gonna trust that the Lord is directing my steps and he might take me somewhere that I don't plan on going. How do I respond to that? Well, if you're like me, a lot of times you respond with God. Why is this happening? I've got things to do. I have a checklist. I want to get this done and this done and this done and this done, right? And then I don't get those things done. And then I think the whole world ends, right? Am I the only one? No. <laughs> and then the Lord says, you know, but I want to teach you something. See, there's somebody maybe that I want to interrupt your day that you need to make a phone call to or that I'm gonna make you run into somebody and you need to stop what you're doing and sit and have a cup of coffee with them and encourage them in me, right? But you know, sometimes we're just too busy. Well, shame on us, right? <laughs> we need to stop that. You are a holy, set-apart person that God's got a call on your life and he wants to use you and do something. And it's not just here, it's out there right? And let's just pray that the Lord would do that for all of us. Lord, help me to be more sensitive to your spirit and what you may have that happens in the day. You may have a call. I, I may need to call somebody, right? Have you ever gotten that call that somebody says, hey, I was just thinking about you, right? Now, here's what happens when that happens to me. I get that call, and in my mind, I'm like, oh, well, that's really great, but I'm busy, and then so you try to be nice and listen to them instead of just putting the brakes on and say, okay, you know what? This is not an accident. This person has called me, so maybe the Lord's got something he wants to do in this. Right? What would happen is if us followers of Jesus really started being a little more in tune with the Spirit about our day-to-day -day walk instead of just looking for the big things? What do you think God would do? Well, I know what he'd do. He would change me and he would change the people around me, right? And I think life would just be a lot easier because if something happens, I'm okay, well, Lord, you're in control. I'm planning this and I'm trying to be a good steward, but you're directing my steps. So whatever you have, I want to follow you. Amen. 